hello everyone. My name is Justin Gunther. I'm the director here at Falling Water, and I want to thank you for joining us for today's webinar. We're honored to have architect Ken Dalen with us today for an enlightening presentation on what he's entitled Falling Water, a Spatial Unveiling. Uh, in today's webinar, Ken will illustrate how Falling Water is an exemplar of this idea of spatial concealing and revealing, or what the Japanese call Migakure, and I'm sure I butchered that pr uh, pronunciation, <laughs> but, it's this, okay. but it's this technique of hiding and then revealing. So what's hidden will be revealed. And Frank Lloyd Wright learned of this concept through his passionate exploration of Japanese art and culture, particularly through his fascination with the Japanese woodblock print. Um, so in today's talk, we'll learn how Wright's connections to Japanese woodblock prints help shape his conceptions of organic space, and also why, why Wright's ideas about space differed from the European modernist ideas of shaping space. Um, throughout today's presentation, if you have questions, please uh, feel free to use the chat or the Q&A functions uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'll watch and monitor the chat and Q&A throughout Ken's presentation. Um, so we'll have about 10, 15 minutes at the end of, of the talk to field some of those questions. And we'll also record today's webinar. So if you want to come back and revisit uh, any of the topics that you learn about today, um, or if you want to pass it along to friends or colleagues that you think would enjoy it, please do so. Uh, we'll have it available on our website at fallingwater.org uh, slash webinars in a couple of days. So Probably by the end of the week, uh, you can find the recording on our website. Um, so to further introduce our speaker, Ken, it's an honor to have you with us today. We greatly appreciate you participating uh, in our webinar series. Uh, Ken Dalen is an architect and scholar whose work and research centers on the aesthetics and historical foundations of Frank Lloyd Wright's organic architecture, including Wright's connections to the Japanese Edo period. Ken received his doctorate at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee's School of Architecture with his dissertation, The Aesthetics of Frank Lloyd Wright's Organic Architecture, Hagley, Japanese Art and Modernism. His recent peer-reviewed article, The Japanese Print as a Lens to Understanding Wright's Organic Space, appeared in Andon, uh, the Journal of the Society of Japanese Art, Ken also serves on the board of Wright in Wisconsin and authors a column, Wright Thoughts, in its newsletter. He's CEO of the award-winning firm Genesis Architecture in Racine, Wisconsin, which focuses on organic and natural architecture. So Ken, with that introduction, um, I'll turn the presentation over to you. Well, thank you and, and good morning or good afternoon for those on the East Coast. Um, it's an honor to be invited and I look forward to our presentation here. I've got uh, quite a few slides and things to talk about. So I'm gonna jump right into sharing. And uh, as Justin said, we can take some Q&A at the end. Okay, I hope everybody sees the beginning slide here. Okay, so Falling Water was uh, built in 1937, and it was arguably the most famous building designed by arguably the most famous architect in modern history. It has been named the best American building of the last 125 years by the American Institute of Architects. Much has been written about it already, including its relationship to the international style of modernism by which it is often compared. For example, the late architectural historian Vincent Scully argued that Wright's early influence on European modernism later came back full circle to where European modernism had influenced Falling Waters form. I'm gonna be taking a different approach to Falling Water today, approaching it from the East rather than from Western Europe. That is from the art and architecture of Japan, which Wright called the most nature loving country in the world. Falling Water's relationship to nature, of course, is its reason for being. But how it particularly relates to nature has many surprising parallels with the art and architecture of Japan. 
In this presentation, I will focus on space, how it is portrayed in Japanese art, architecture, and garden design, and how Wright portrayed this idea of organic space in his architecture, and more specifically, at Falling Water. This particular print you see on the screen is located in the guest house of Falling Water, and it was a gift by Wright to the Kaufmans in 1935, uh, Hiroshige's night snow uh, image, which I'll be uh, showing some more of. Wright said, the Japanese house fascinated me and I would spend many hours taking it to pieces and putting it back together again. And yet, Wright stated later in 1957, I remember when I first met the Japanese prince, that art had a great influence on my feeling and thinking. Japanese architecture, nothing at all. But when I saw that print and I saw the elimination of the insignificant and simplicity of vision together with the sense of rhythm and the importance of design, I began to see nature in a totally different way. While I doubt his denial about Japanese architecture here, what actually did he mean by seeing nature in a totally different way through the print? It's a striking admission coming from Wright that Japanese art had such a profound influence on his perception of nature. This is another print uh, by Hiroshige in the Falling Water collection. There are a total of six Japanese prints at Falling Water, five by Hiroshige and one by Hokusai. These are accessible on the fallingwater.org website under their collections search area. In 1912, Wright wrote this book on the Japanese print. In this book, he lays out or laid out far reaching statements about not only the art of the print, but about the source of beauty, the elimination of the insignificant as a means to emphasizing underlying reality, the symbolic power of form and geometry. He begins the book by stating to his Western audience, the need for them to take a quote, unfamiliar viewpoint, the purely aesthetic viewpoint, he says, and that how understanding these prints could serve to quote, awaken the artistic conscience. And he adds, or at least to shame them to the fact that they have no conscience. Uh, this print uh, is also a print by Hiroshige. I will be examining the Japanese print shortly, but first a little context on the sighting and organization of falling water. Edgar Kaufman Sr. originally had expected that Wright would have placed the house on the south bank of the stream behind where you see the blue arrow so that it would look toward the face of the waterfall. The key design move, however, by Wright was to perch the house just over the waterfall. By this move, the stream and falls are concealed from those in most parts of the house, yet it is heard. The Wright scholar, Neil Levine, writes about the importance of this auditory aspect of falling water and its temporal implications in his essay in the Falling Water book edited by Linda Wagner. As it is, the stream and waterfall are slowly revealed in glimpses in part upon further exploration and progression. One aspect of falling water that struck me when I was there recently, um, and that's not something you experience in the photos, is that falling water site is the stream. And I don't mean just the falls. When there, one does not sense the beginning nor the end of the stream. And yet the stream always continues and flows from east to west. Falling water is both a point in space upon that stream and temporarily, it's a moment in time in the sense of the eternal. The photos don't properly show the context of how large nature is compared to the house. And yet wonderfully, this house creates a presence upon it, a dignity which holds its own in the vastness of nature. This is the early floor plan of falling water that Wright produced in those two hours while Edgar Kaufman was on his way from Milwaukee to Spring Green. Uh, importantly, it reveals his organizational and structural concept for the house. Falling water was natural and organic, uh, not because it abandoned an ordering system and gave way to irregularity. If you look at the five parallel lines that I highlighted in red here, uh, with it, this sets up the whole house plan in Wright's floor plan. Order is first superimposed on nature. The grid ties into nature in a way which relates to the orientation and the natural features uh, and is perpendicular to the stream. Those five lines or vectors of force 
are conceptually as if they were springing forth out of the North Stone embankment and the rock boulders on that side and then extending south over the stream as a cantilever. I believe this is Wright's prime organizing principle of falling water. These five lines set up the cantilever and upon the cantilevered beams or piers then can rest both the parallel and perpendicular concrete trays from which to relate to the river. The five parallel lines going roughly north-south are an ingenious method which allows a shifting or a sliding along those lines north or south to accommodate nature and to set up the stepped plan that, that we see here or uh, the flying geese formation that in, ensued. It is the core of the ordering system and adaptability of that grid at the same time. The cross section in the upper right of the slide here shows the red lines of the structural cantilever in the horizontal uh, direction in relation to the vertical stone elements anchoring the cantilever, the, the tall uh, stone element, of course, uh, much like the trunk of a tree carries the branches that, uh, that spread out from that. The existing old mining drive or road just behind the house um, uh, and, be, and adjoining the adjoining rock wall uh, behind it on the north side sets up a diagonal geometry uh, between itself and the bridge and the house. Now the shortest and simplest way to close the rear of the house would have been a simple diagonal line, which here right of course avoids. However, Wright does not abandon the structural and ordering lines he set up that we saw in the floor plan. This allows a stair stepping along that back wall to approximate what would be a diagonal path. These corners can be seen as bays sliding up and down, adjusting to the site while keeping a sense of order. Again, stone against stone. The north side of the house is almost all stone relating to the existing stone embankment behind it. The solidity of this north stone foundation sets up the soaring cantilevers extending out to the south. And of course, he literally makes the connection to the north rock face with the concrete trellis beams that he ties into them. A side note about waterfalls. Um, this is not the first time that Wright engaged a stream or waterfall in his designs. The scholar Catherine Smith has written an essay on the subject of Wright's waterfall buildings in Robert McCarter's book, On and by Frank Lloyd Wright, A Primer in Architectural Principles. She shows how we see waterfalls and features showing up on Wright's designs, such as the unbuilt Harold McCormick House of 1908, which you see on the left side of the slide, uh, the Horseshoe Inn at Estes Park, Colorado, which bridges over a stream, Taliesin's own dam and waterfall, which is shown on the right side of this, uh, this slide, the Sherman Booth House of 1911, and the unbuilt Ottawara Hotel of 1917, to name a few. On his return to Taliesin after meeting at the Kaufman site, Wright is reported to have written Kaufman, quote, the visit to the waterfall in the woods stays with me and the domicile has taken vague shape in my mind to the music of the stream. On Wright's first trip to Japan back in 1905, he took photos of places he visited and then there was a subsequent book later that you can buy called Frank Lloyd Wright's 50 Views of Japan which contains photos from his photo album of the time. Interestingly, some 25% of the photos in that album are of waterfalls, including these two images above uh, taken in Miko. Uh, it's also thought that he may have uh, had some of these prints not taken by himself, but were uh, postcards that he obtained. In either case, they, they made it into his album and were very important to him. Wright was not only interested in the Japanese print, he was an accomplished dealer in them who both owned and purchased for others many of the outstanding impressions that are in our major US museums today. The print here by Hokusai was uh, also one that Wright owned and was familiar with. It depicts a group of travelers pausing by the Ono waterfall with a Shinto shrine precariously close by there by the waterfall. Waterfalls were often a destination for the religious who purified themselves in the cold waters from the falls. Before I go back and show how falling water expresses organic space, I wanna look a little into how Wright thought about organic space and why this wasn't just simply about breaking down the box and opening up the corners, even though this was one of his early goals. The Roby house you see here, 
along with other right prairie homes of the first decade of the 20th century had a major impact on European modernist architects. One of them, Mies van der Rohe, took this idea of open space further when he proposed his universal space, suggesting buildings set in an unbroken grid, uh, extending infinitely in all four directions, a sort of architectural placelessness. But this idea of space ran contrary to the type of particularization of space and specific placemaking that Wright sought in his integration with each landscape. His uh, rights was not a universal solution for all places, but something which was to grow out of the nuances of each place. A better way, I think, to understand Wright's form of spatial construction is through the lens of the pre-Meiji era Japanese print than through reductionist modernist narratives. While lately it seems we have blurred the line between them and placed them both under the capital M of modernism, to write the international style architecture with its free plans and open space was apparently missing something important. Late in Wright's career, he wrote of European modernist architecture, quote, this modern architecture we see as a negation in two dimensions, an improvement, yes, but with too little evidence of the depths of the architecture conceived according to principle, built from inside outward as organism, the tranquil emphasis on space as the reality of the building is mostly missing. To sum up, organic architecture sees the third dimension never as weight or mere thickness, but always as depth. Depth and element of space, the third or thickness dimension transformed to a space, space dimension, unquote. Wright would apply this principle to amplify physical three-dimensional architectural space into what he saw as a higher dimension of spatial expression, which he referred to as organic space. Wright indicated this missing element has to do with a certain sense of depth. If European modernism was missing something spatially, he felt it was to be found in the Japanese print. At a Taliesin print party in 1950, Wright spoke of the Japanese print's power both to inform perception and to amplify, amplify its spatial depth through what he understood as a dimensional transformation. And he states, quote, so here you have a new way of looking at the landscape. And the landscape has never seemed the same to me since I became familiar with the print. You're continually seeing differently. You're seeing eliminating, you're seeing arranging, you're seeing, I don't know exactly how to put it, not in three dimensions, certainly, and yet perhaps that is the element of the third dimension made manifest by two, unquote. Along with this third, uh, this emergent third dimension in the print, Wright provided further clues to the type of spatial construction he saw evidenced in them. Hiroshige did with a sense of space very much what we have been doing with it in our architecture, he says. Here you get a sense of tremendous, limitless space instead of something confined within a picture. On what is your attention focused? Nothing, unquote. So the spatial construction of the Japanese print is a clue to understanding the spatial depth in Wright's architecture. Wright saw in the aesthetic conventions of the Japanese landscape print, how the contour line, figure ground, and layered planes produce the perception of three-dimensional space within its two-dimensional medium. He goes on to say, quote, see how simply they get in three planes. They rendered all of this sense of distance. There is no lack of perspective here, as you'll notice. They're supposed not to have known perspective. They knew all they wanted of it. They didn't want much of it because perspective introduced an element which was not necessary to their feeling for beauty, unquote. The perceptual theorist Rudolf Arnheim of the 20th century described the three-dimensional perception, uh, how the three-dimensional perception of space is reduced to a two-dimensional projection on the retina of the eye and then interpreted by the brain. Depth perception follows when two-dimensional contours occlude other figures in the mind's completion of incomplete shapes. The figure ground relationship is the basis of this layered or planar system of perception. This is just a page from his book, Art and Visual Perception. Using Hiroshige's night snow print as an example, 
Here's a composition with background, middle ground, and foreground elements with spatial depth produced by what Arnheim refers to as frontal planes and figure ground relationships. Lacking is the Western system of linear perspective, yet the eye recognizes which areas of the print are foreground and background immediately because the contour lines and their associated planes occlude other areas that are perceived to be behind them. The eye sees this foreground plane as the closest element to the viewer. Notice that this image is not constructed with one or two point perspective we're accustomed to in the West. Then a middle ground plane in this, uh, this yellow green, another middle ground plane, but just behind the last one. And why do we know it's just behind? Uh, there's, no, there's no one point perspective here showing it, but we have two visual cue, uh, cues here. We have the contour line boundary between those two, between the green and the blue here, and the plane which occludes part of the layer behind it. Finally, the background layer, and there's a couple of additional intervening layers there too. When Wright created the drawing of the Dana House for the Vasmut portfolio in 1910, he did not place the viewpoint in this particular view uh, in the more expected place where the entire volume of the space was visible, but outside of it where framing planes and layers that partially obscured the space were made part of the composition, thus amplifying the sense of depth. By this, he partially reveals, but also conceals the spaces much like the Japanese print and very much the way the Japanese concept of Miyagakure works, which I'll develop in a moment. This is a view into the living room of Wright's Bernard Schwartz house in Two Rivers, Wisconsin. Here with the various planes highlighted, we see how Wright's space is broken up as if he delights to deny us the ability to see the whole space in one view. These brick planes, even the ceiling height change, are setting up depth cues, just as in the Japanese print. Is this what Wright meant when he said that the print somehow is manifesting the third dimension within the two dimensions of their medium? And then when Wright further said that he was doing in his architecture what Hiroshige was doing with space, could this be what he was talking about? Also, when Wright claimed that space in modern architecture lacked the depth that his organic space did, was this um, um, what he meant? Um, uh, sorry, I moved ahead there. Uh, could this be what he was talking about then? Uh, also, um, was this his method of amplifying that sense of three-dimensional space that he was trying to convey in the same way that the Japanese print amplified the depth sense in 2D space? Here, Wright is doing the same in 3D space. While he's working here in an extra dimension that the print had, uh, what they do have in common is how our vision compresses both on the eye's retina that is a two-dimensional image, as I had just mentioned. There's another quality which is set up by this planar occlusion here. Uh, that is represented by the arrows. The space here is still one continuous space. It is neither a series of rooms next to each other as boxes, nor the modern universal space. But this partial concealing and partial revealing of the space rewards a certain progression through the space, a path of discovery. This is what we will see in the Japanese concept of Miyagakure. When I was asked by the Falling Water Organization to present my work for this webinar, I wanted to apply this research to falling water itself to see what could be discovered spatially in the material culture that Wright left behind in this building. What I found upon walking through and around falling water expands this idea in intriguing ways. Uh, the foundational depth perception uh, concepts that I just discussed are still in play here, but I found that falling water is very much a, a very rich and layered work of architecture, which introduces additional spatial qualities. The entrance into the main living space, which you see here, is primarily one large space, and yet Wright provides subtle cues which break up the space into overlapping zones. I've highlighted in red here some of those definers or framers of space, which both add depth and articulation of the space. This includes the subtle contour lines at the ceiling, which add depth even though the rise in the ceiling here is very minor. This is the southeast balcony just off the living room. Note how Wright defines the space even in this exterior area. He defines an overhead plane with the trellis compressing the space between the floor and the trellis. 
while defining vertical walls in the balconies uh, shown in blue here. This uh, is the dining room uh, seen just outside of the kitchen. Once again, we have foreground elements, middle ground, uh, and the ceiling plane as well to define depth and to give that dining area a sense of its own spatial definition within a larger space. Sakuteki was the name of the most famous and oldest Japanese garden manual in the mid 11th century. Sakuteki let out the tenets of the Japanese garden based on six core elements of garden composition that he uh, that was written about there uh, being one artificial ponds or artificial hills, ponds, islands, the south garden, garden stream and waterfalls. View obscuring techniques were described in Sakuteki, which include overlapping, offsetting, and zigzagging objects to provide only partial views of objects and concealing the depth of the site, which in most cases was fairly small and contained. These techniques had the intended effect of giving a small space a sense of limitlessness. Additionally, Sakuteki's principles did not call out for a realistic portrayal of nature, but an evocation of its essence. The idea of distilling the essence rather than a literal imitation of nature would be something which Wright felt as core to his own philosophy of organic architecture. It found resonance in the idealist philosophy Wright adhered to, uh, including Hegel's aesthetics, where he discusses the role of the artist as one who separates out the accidental from the essential when producing a work of art. Wright wrote about the work of the artist or architect as one who could pull out the essence line just beneath aspect, as he called it. In other words, the elimination of the accidental or the insignificant in order to distill out a more pure expression of the quote unquote idea in the work of architecture. There's much that could be added here, but I'm going to continue on with my discussion of space. Historically, until the Edo period in Japan, which went from 1603 to 1867, Japanese gardens did not exist as independent entities, but they were designed to be viewed from a seated position in the building interior, and so were directly correlated to the function and style of the architecture. As Professor Toshiro Inaji points out in the diagram on the right, the north rooms of the typical Shinden Zukuri building were uh, generally the smaller rooms with more confined and framed views to the north landscape, which was closer into the building. The gardens were designed to relate to the individual framed views from these separate rooms and yet still have a continuous aspect when seen from the north veranda. Consequently, these north side gardens were the higher density gardens, often with rock outcroppings or even waterfalls. Sometimes these waterfalls were artful but man-made constructions that symbolized flowing water but were dry. Other times actual water flowed from the north end of the structure and then underneath it, finally exiting the building on the south side where the views were more expansive, sometimes symbolizing a sea or a lake. The south room was a larger, broader room where a more expansive view could be seen from. The method used to link these completely distinct interior spaces and their respective gardens into one continuous building and garden form within Japanese architecture, while also barring the view from one to another was Miyagakure. And the architectural composition used to affect this was the diagonally stepped, what they call the geese in flight formation that had been used earlier in asymmetrical Shinden Zukuri mansions. Uh, Katsura Imperial Palace on the left is a classic example of the geese in flight layout. The term Miegakure literally means to hide and reveal. And this was first used in regard to the techniques employed in the small rustic walkways known as roji that led to tea houses. Effects are created that provide a sense of depth and pique the viewer's expectations of the next scene by, for instance, interrupting lines of sight, concealing the depth of the sight and obscuring the overall view. And we see that diagram in the upper right corner there um, of that idea, uh, the roji path. As Inaji states in his book, in principle, no element of the roji is shown in its entirety, like something intimated in what is left unsaid, the roji's very spirit derives from its suggestiveness, and it is this that gives the garden its profundity. 
We also see the idea of Miyagakure expressed in the woodblock print, such as in the Hiroshige print of Mount Arama here. The arrows I added show the progression of space through a partial concealing and revealing sequence, much as in the Roji pathway in garden design. The next series of photos I will show are photos that I took while I was at Falling Water. Uh, this, this slide here though, uh, with the floor plan and arrows shows the path one takes to, to the approach uh, to enter and, and to begin movement through the house. As you can see, it is anything but straightforward and this path of procession is only slowly revealing what is concealed beyond. And as we know, this is not unique to Falling Water right in this uh, quite often in his designs. Well, the iconic view of falling water that we all know um, would seem to indicate a lofty and a vertical building. The actual approach to the house is one of descending down to the house and to its main level, as we can see here uh, coming toward the bridge. The building actually seems to sit low and humbly on its site, as if just brooding over and hiding the stream. As we approach the bridge here, no front door, nor even a suggestion as to how one enters the building is seen. Getting closer, we see the iconic cantilevered prow on the left here, seemingly buried in the leaves of the nearby trees, not soaring majestically as we often think of it. By now, while we can't see the stream, we can hear it. On the bridge, here we can see straight through to, uh, actually straight through the living room, as we're at the same level as the first floor and the ribbon of glass seems to slice through the horizontal opaque concrete elements. One of the first surprises of the Miyaga Curry effect at falling water during this approach to the building is how the Roji path or this path of hiding and revealing is not just a horizontal spatial revealing, but here the surprise reveal is in the vertical axis, not just falling water, but falling space. In other words, vistas are opening up here that fall out below you as you approach an edge boundary, in this case, the parapet of the bridge, and then see that stream of water percolating out of the deep rock and rift that the house becomes married with, like something hidden, something precious, heard, but not seen, yet finally revealed. A short video clip. Bring in some of the sound. You, you, the sound is so important to falling water. Down at the grotto level, looking back to the bridge in this view, uh, after you descend the stairs that you see in the, the right side here, uh, the water is smooth and it reflects the sky and the clouds above. It's, uh, it's like an outdoor room, a very different but special space to experience the more quiet stream above the falls. But continuing our approach from the bridge uh, around the corner, we're in a canyon of stone, natural on the right uh, and man-made on the left, knit together by right with the concrete trellis work and the bridge beyond. On the way to the entrance, the solid stone wall on the left uh, image here gives way to a glimpse, just a glimpse through to the terrace in the south. The right photo shows the front door but it's still mostly hidden and it's also compressed. Making a, a, a couple uh, turns, 90 degrees, and walking up three steps, this is our first view of the main space. The area on the east or the, the left side of the slide seems almost uh, outside as the skylight glass and the trellis beams overhead flood that area with additional light and the stone columns seem to signify the transition to the interior space to the, which is to the, to the right. One of the spatial surprises at Falling Water is the south main glass area here. One would think that this generous expanse of glass would look out on a vast exterior view, but in fact, the leaves and branches of the adjacent trees are so close to the house that the space expands out only partially and the trees become the horizontal band of green inside the house. Some have likened it to like a wallpaper or the decoration. 
course, when the leaves are off the trees, the whole other sense of space opens up. This is Villa Savoy by Le Corbusier, just outside of Paris. The ribbon windows here have been suggested as an influence on Wright when he designed Falling Water. While there are superficial similarities here, I think the differences are really more important. At Villa Savoy, the ribbon window is an abrupt cut in the white wall, which creates a picture frame view of the surrounding trees as an object of detached contemplation. Indeed, the entire house perches itself up on its piloni as if not to contaminate itself with nature. Whereas in Falling Water, the quote ribbon window, if you want to call it that, is designed to dissolve and blur the boundary between inside and outside so that the viewer feels at one with nature rather than contemplating nature as one would be viewing a picture in a museum. Notice how the ceiling plane continues outside past through the glass. Where the balconies don't already extend further out, right extends the ceiling with these thin brows of concrete um, that we see here, for example. This uh, little video clip is taken actually on the second floor terrace. And I hope you can hear the sound okay. It's, it's one of the unique things about being at Falling Water is how the sound changes based on where you're um, positioned. And even within a couple of feet, it can change quite a bit. And as I'm circling around here, you get the view of this outdoor room in the trees and the treetops. But as I get closer to the edge here, uh, you'll notice how the, the sound opens up as we have the, the river exposed. Uh, this is the main floor plan again of Falling Water. Just as in the Japanese house, how it sets up the multiple spatially framed areas and the Miyagakuri effect, uh, look how many varied spaces Wright has set up at Falling Water, both inside and outside. This is the approach and the compression at the entry, as we saw in some of the photos previous. Upon entry, we're treated with a specific and edited view revealing a certain aspect of the house. And one of the things I didn't really understand from photos until I was there was just how much light pours into that area, which is in the vicinity of where the stairs go down, uh, the trellis with glass there. It's almost kind of a greenhouse effect, um, kind of a transitional space. And it's view straight through, again, you have that, you have that edited view of nature outside the windows, outside the glass. Uh, from the living room itself, looking straight south, we're given this view of the wall of green uh, from the trees just beyond the glass, as I pointed out before. From the sitting bench looking west, uh, we have a view of a smaller exterior space, much like the Shinden Zukuri room looking out to a, spe a specific garden view. Again, a much smaller, more intimate exterior space. Not to be missed, of course, is the expansive view out to and beyond the southwest terrace looking over the waterfall and down the stream. Even the kitchen has a magnificent view through the horizontally stacked glass units to the smaller space defined by the terrace and the trees. And one of my unexpected favorites, which I showed a photo before that grotto area, um, the view obtained at the bottom of the stairs from the living room, revealing a space defined by bridge and woods, stone and stream, grotto-like space down below that yet reflects the sky above. To write at the essence of organic architecture is the idea of the integrated whole, the part to whole unity of the design. The idea of a harmonious unity, which brings about beauty, was essential to him, but it was an integrated whole rather than an additive or subtractive whole. This implies a subordination of the parts to a larger whole, of course, the part to whole unity that he spoke of. By way of contrast, as an example of what we might call additive architecture near the Virginia State Capitol, notice the elements, the core elements are uh, pure rectangles in themselves. They could stand on themselves without being connected, but uh, each has their own 
uh, static symmetry and, uh, and whole volume. Even Wright's very early floor plans uh, were still very additive. Uh, this is the Husser house uh, he did in 1899. And it's not just traditional architecture that can be additive. Contemporary examples abound, including our current fascination with the box. With Wright's Roby House of 1907, we see greater integration and subordination of parts to holes integrated into a unity rather than an assembly of separate parts which maintain their static completeness independent from the whole. The individual parts give way or subordinate their form in a way which is proportional to the relationship they have with adjoining parts. Or to use the human body as an example, consider the hand and how it as a form does not make much sense when it's separated from the rest of the body, but it's interrelated as it has uh, both function and formal purpose um, in that case. Uh, later on Wright's work, we see uh, his Usonian era homes like the Gesch Winkler home of 1940 that you see here. A very small floor plan, uh, but see how elegantly it shows the idea of the integrated whole. Notice, for example, how the shape of the grass lanai on the left of the plan loses its unbroken rectangular, quote, purity in order to be more integrated into the house itself. And so in this case, it has a notch cut out of that form. Uh, which is then made whole by that part of the bedroom, which then uh, fills in that corner. Uh, thus, both forms work together or knit themselves together into this greater or integrated whole. In the same way in this plan, notice how the overall house plan would not be as elegant were one to chop off that lanai. The overall floor plan would lose its extension and grace. Uh, Wright was a master of proportion and something we often forget in uh, our contemporary architecture today. Wright said, uh, when this unfolding, uh, quote unquote, when this unfolding architecture as distinguished from N folding architecture comes to America, there will be truth of feature to truth of being. Clearly this new conception will realize architecture is no longer the sculpted or sculptured block of some building material, material or as any uh, N folding imitation. Architecture must now unfold uh, an inner content, express life from the within. An architecture no longer composed or arranged or pieced together as symbolic, but living as upstanding expression of reality." Uh, unquote. Wright's distinction above between the enfolding and the unfolding aspects of architecture reflect the difference he felt between the old classical or self-contained box form and the new organic form of architecture. Enfolding with an E implies an enclosure from without encasing the inner. It imposes predetermined form from the outside which confines the inner layout. However, the unfolding architecture is an architecture where the external expression of form is the result of inner forces expanding outward according to their free play in nature. Falling water, perhaps more than any of his designs, express this idea of unfolding I just put that curve there. It's almost as if the, the geometry is spiraling out of the rock and, and then soaring or, or perching and cantilevering itself over the falls. In this next series of slides, uh, we'll see these rectangular spaces as if they're cascading out from the stone core, almost as if spiraling out or unfolding, as if growing out and cantilevering out uh, toward and just over the waterfall. These in blue are all at first floor level just showing that progression of unfolding. Second floor in the orange, uh, very similar until we have the final prow, which is the second uh, floor terrace at the end. Finally, the third floor. This idea of the integrated whole symbolized here by the Nautilus shell um, is the idea not only, not only of an unfolding and growth, but also the idea that the part cannot be fully understood apart from the whole. This happens on many scales, whether it is at the detail level and how the layered stonework integrates into the steps and stairs at falling water, or how the house itself cannot stand alone or be fully understood apart from the site it is a part of. There should be a unity across multiple scales. And ending where I began, this is of course the iconic view. Um, and I purposely showed this view because uh, 
when you're actually on site, it, what surprised me was how big nature was, as I mentioned earlier on. Uh, my, the first glimpse of falling water is from a distance and it, it seems quite small there. Um, but that be as it may, this, this is the iconic view and I'll show you a couple more slides zooming in here. Um, but I, I wanna ask the question, we, we call it the iconic view, but why is the iconic view iconic of falling water? Because here at last, after our various and limited unveilings, our partial and our framed experiences of the place, we see it now in its most total expression of a unified whole. While no one can, uh, while no one view can reveal the entirety of the building, it is this view which distills the essence of its meaning. There is certainly an aesthetic appeal to this view, but it is aesthetically beautiful due to the underlying ideas it expresses. It's a revealing of the house as growing out of the deep and the ancient stone, which is the anchoring point and becomes its vertical datum. From this heavy stone, we see the springing forth of the cantilever in the horizontal uh, concrete elements, which like branches spread out over the waterfall, covering it as if it were compressing the waterfall and heightening the drama of the water itself and framing its release over the rock and down the stream. Falling water is a moment captured and frozen in the continuous flow of the stream, a particularization and a symbol of the unstoppable flow of time. But here it is, not the water only, but the experience and presence of a place, a moment on the stream. All the smaller partial views and experiences of Miega Curry were set up by right to reveal the various facets of what it is like to dwell in or to experience this place. Architecture here shows us both the temporal and the eternal in the river and of place made special because the architecture frames for us the presence of nature here. For what is architecture but the framing of human experience within the larger scale of its place. Thank you. Ken, that was a, a beautiful presentation and your explanation of, of iconic at the end. Um, fantastic, one of the best explanations I've ever heard about why, why that view is so iconic. Uh, and you've given us some fresh perspectives uh, on how to understand and look and learn from this place. So thank you so much for that presentation. Um, You're welcome. Well, we'll take a couple questions um, and sure. maybe I'll open with one and then dive into some of the participants' questions. Um, you, you've clearly done a great deal of, of research and, and gained some great understanding of, of what all of this means. How have you translated those ideas into your own work, studying rights work, uh, the Japanese principles, and then integrating that into your own practice? Yes, as an architect, you're always, um, you know, balancing between the everyday work that you need to do for business and, mm -hmm. and the opportunities you might have for artistic expression. Um, there is a project uh, that's on the boards that I've been working on. Um, I'll probably have to share my screen again. I suppose I can just go please back do. and do that. Yeah, yeah. Please do. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Okay, um, I hope, do you see the, the, the falling water screen right now? We do, Ken, yeah. Okay, okay, so let me just jump ahead here. Um, this is a project I'm calling uh, the Ukiyo-e House. Um, it's in Kansas, Wichita, Kansas area for a client I have there and um, the idea was what might right do with Usonian design in, in our time? So there's, there's a lot of things going on here. Uh, for one, uh, architectonically, we have the idea of the use of plywood. So Wright used plywood you know, famously in his Usonian homes. Um, and here I used it, uh, really the, almost the entire house is made of plywood, obviously not the concrete slab and the brick, but uh, or the glass, but uh, it's used not only decoratively, but structurally. 
these elements here are structural trusses that are made of three plies of plywood. We use current CNC uh, technology to cut these, which would have been just absorbent, labor intensive without the, the technology we have. Um, but it's that idea of integral ornament that Wright talked about. I'm not trying to deny ornament or be minimal about it, but to integrate it, uh, that whole idea of the integrated whole and bringing it together. Floor plan, very small, 1500 square foot house. Um, a cross section kind of showing structurally what's happening. And um, a lot of work going into the various pieces, what works uh, physically and structurally and what they can cut and the size of the cutting uh, beds that they have, the vacuum beds and such. So um, that's just a little snapshot of one of the things uh, that we're working on that uh, I'm excited about and conveying this idea of ukiyo-e, which I, I guess I didn't point out is this idea of how do we create depth? What was this idea of organic space that Wright was, was after? And I think here, as you can see in this image, um, these very literally two-dimensional planes um, creating these depth cues, these contours, uh, really accentuating uh, the sense of depth in what's otherwise quite a small, uh, quite a small house. And I'll uh, leave it at that. Wonderful, thanks, Ken. Um, you, you clearly deeply understand um, Wright's architecture and also falling water. One of our participants asked, however, did you have an aha moment when you walked through falling water and experienced falling water ahead of this presentation? Yes, I kind of alluded to those in my discussion, but probably the two things uh, that uh, affected me the most or I was surprised about the most um, were how large nature is. I, I kind of hinted that at that one end slide, you know, the first view of that quote, iconic view of, of falling water was very tiny. You know, the, the trees, the, the, the sense of scale uh, just surrounding it is, is so immense. You know, we always see photos like we're right up to it, but if you follow the stream before and after, um, you get a sense that this isn't just about a waterfall. There's a continuity there. There's a sense of time. There's a, there's a sense of this spot in time, this spot on the river. Uh, so I think that I would not have gained from, from the images or the photos. Um, the other thing, uh, which I, I kind of showed a picture of too, which was certainly unexpected, was that little grotto space down by the bridge. I, you, you take the stairs down from the living room and, um, and then opens up this whole other, what I want to call a room. It's outside, but the, the bridge defines one edge. You know, you got the stone on the left, you got the trees on the other, you got the sky and, and, the, and the water. Um, just wonderful. And there's, a, there's another story behind that in terms of uh, Wright really had to fight with Edgar Kaufman to get that, uh, that stare included because Edgar didn't see really the need. It was extraneous. It was, you know, what was the value of that? Um, I'm very glad it, uh, that Wright went out on that one and, and we have that stair there. I love that you call it a grotto because it really is this space for contemplation and just relaxation, which is what you would do in a grotto. And I've never heard it referred to that way as, as a grotto room or a grotto space. That's really wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, you, you spent a lot of time talking about uh, Wright gaining this understanding of depth from Japanese woodblock prints. Did he get an understanding of the temporal dimension of space too from Japanese art and culture? The, in the sense that we're relating it to falling water here, I'm not sure I understand the question, but I would just say in relation to that, and this, I, I, this may not answer the, the, the questioner's question, but when Wright saw the print, since we're talking about the print, um, the thing that he pointed out specifically we know comes from him is it did not have the it was not constructed by linear western perspective so let's just take the idea of one point perspective if you have a picture that's designed to one point perspective you've got vanishing lines you've got a point uh in the center uh that's the vanishing point or in two point you know perspective you got two points but um what that means is that the viewpoint of what image you're seeing is really only accurate at one exact point uh, that where the perspective is accurate. What he saw with this uh, flat planar uh, construction is, he called it limitless. Uh, on what is your eye focused? Nothing, he said. Uh, so really, it, it, it's, it's not so limiting in his sense. It, you, can, you can see it from different, different points. 
Um, and, um, and that may not be addressing exactly this idea of the temporal aspect, um, but this idea of limitless in the print itself. Nice. Um, <clears throat> question here, and I'll read it to you. Does your analysis allow for the inclusion of defensive space, meaning while one encounters the architecture, the space may conceal the fact that the architecture and its occupants may be watching you? Yeah, I think this might be relating to the idea of prospect and refuge, perhaps, and, and that has been written about quite a bit about Falling Water, Grant Hildebrand and others. Um, yeah, one of the difficulties was there's so much, uh, so many angles I could have approached this house on, but absolutely, um, <clears throat> it, it's, it's part and parcel of what he's doing here. Uh, it's not either or, it's both and. So the idea of uh, spaces where you can be protected in, in a defensive and then yet see to the prospect uh, are definitely in play here. And um, I, I suppose maybe part of that question was those in the, in the building seeing those coming, perhaps that's the same idea, however, I think. Great. Any suggestions on how to incorporate some of these principles of Japanese architecture into your own apartment or home. So if you're already inhabiting a space, how might you introduce some of these con concepts into your living space? Sure. The big idea here is that um, the goal isn't just to make the space seem as open, you know, as possible. That that was not Wright's goal, you know, to break the box down. It, it can be a little bit confusing, but you want to frame it and uh, whether it's uh, a Japanese plant or some kind of plant that kind of creates that foreground. You have, once you do that, it's, it could be a frame, it could be, you know, a post, it could be a column, it could be a piece of furniture, it could be a built-in set of cabinetry. Um, the whole key is how you sculpt it. Obviously it needs some artistry in terms of what is the proportion of what you open versus what you close. I mean, there's, there's so much of mastery in what Wright does that is easy to miss, but there's there's so much there uh, that has to do with not just too much, not too little. It's got to be just right. It's got to be artfully done, um, so it doesn't seem too closed or too open. You know, it's that kind of that middle way that Wright espouses. Yeah, the European modernists took it to the extreme with the universal open space, but it's like let's pull it back. There's something <laughs> more here that's that's missing, and it's not the Victorian, you know, small rooms, you know, next to other rooms and the boxiness. It breaks it out, but there's kind of this cohesiveness there. So yeah, whether it's uh, art, uh, it's plants, um, furniture, it just depends, I guess, on the extent of the renovation or the the decoration in that space that that one's dealing with. Another question. So that this participant wrote that the path of discovery and compression and release are examples of the principles at the heart of your presentation. Any other examples we might recognize that you can quickly point out? Um, other examples? And maybe that gets to the whole dichotomy that Wright <laughs> uses in his architecture. Soft, hard, light, dark, compression, release, precariousness, stability, all of those kind of things maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mentioned like the, the, the prospect and refuge uh, that we could look at it from a uh, geometric standpoint, the how the floor plan was put together, how it could be seen as a progression from the prairie through the Usonian styles, things like that. Um, light and dark, or you might've said that already, but just the, um, uh, the um, not the editing, the kind of, uh, choreographing of one's uh, movement through light and dark. And we, as we saw, as you enter the light coming through the trellis, that was another thing that I, although I'd seen it in photos, I hadn't really noticed it until I was there. Um, and how that large space in, in the living room, which is kind of atypical for Wright, um, but it's very nuanced in, in the sense of how the space is feel depending where you are, whether it's the dining table back near the rock face, whether it's out uh, on, in the south area, whether it's by the fireplace, there's, there's a, a lot of different uh, experiences that open up in that one space. And our material, I mean, yeah, organic, arch you could talk about materials, the use of the natural use of materials, um, the stone, the 
you know, whether it's the, the, the flagstone, uh, the concrete, the color, you know, he wanted to do that originally with a gold leaf, which was not yeah. done. And um, yeah, I, I guess it's almost, I, I would need more kind of ideas of where you want to take it, but there's, there's certainly yeah. so many places you can discuss this. And since we're just about out of time, this is kind of a fun one to end on because it's one of those philosophical mm -hmm. questions. Um, but were there some Frank Lloyd Wright designs that contradicted the philosophies he used in Falling Water, where Wright learned what he believed would work or not work well in Falling Water and then decided not to do it again? It's a tough question. <laughs> I almost would flip that question and say, how does Falling Water um, go against everything else he had done in the body of his work? You yeah. know, you look at his Usonian era, which this kind of fits within, and this is not a, your typical Usonian house. It doesn't have, you know, the two by four grid. It doesn't have uh, all of those things. It's such a, uh, and that was kind of the challenge of this little project was it is so exceptional, even for Wright's uh, genre of work that, um, you know, it, it doesn't fit that. Um, you know, I, I was wondering about that large space in the living room. You know, does he really provide many depth cues? Is he just kind of laying it out there as this one big space? But being there, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there are a lot of subtle cues. Um, the other thing is the verticality, uh, where this is an exception, the Usonian homes and, and most of his others, they are very horizontally disposed and experienced. You can't experience falling water, but to uh, continually be uh, exposed to the vertical, whether it's, it's falling, space falling, going down or going up, uh, it, it's such a, it's a rich and layered uh, type of thing. So I think, it, you know, that's more the exception than, than the other uh, of his, his projects. Fantastic. But, uh, probably the best example of the unfolding uh, that he, he also talked about. Great. Well, Ken, thank you so much. Um, a couple of closing remarks here um, in terms of, of housekeeping things. If you are a practicing architect and you participated today, we, we did register this lecture so you can get a half of, of a credit of continuing education. So uh, if you're interested in that, if you'll look on your registration for today's webinar, um, you can email me and we can work with you to process uh, that continuing education credit. Um, again, for those of you that are interested in watching again or interested in forwarding along today's presentation, the recording will be available on fallingwater.org in our uh, website, uh, the webinar section of our website. Um, so keep an eye out for that later this week. And again, just a thank you for all of all of you that signed in today um, from all over to, to hear from Ken uh, and his enlightening presentation today. And Ken, again, uh, beautiful presentation, opened our eyes to new ways of looking and understanding, uh, which is always our goal. Um, so thank you so much for your participation. You're very honored. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks, everyone.